Welcome to today's Energy Central Power Session entitled Maximizing Beyond the Meter Revenue Opportunities, an expert roundtable discussion. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. Given the fact that folks are working and schooling from home, we acknowledge that technical issues may be more pronounced. If for any reason we find the uh, need to restart the event, we invite you to click your join link again to stay with us. In that case, we will also resend out those links for you. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial into the audio portion using the telephone number listed in the right-hand panel of your interface under the audio section. Our power session is are intended to be interactive with questions from the audience and the moderator. We invite you to submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Now I'm happy to turn the floor over to David Wagman to kick things off. David, David welcome to the event. You have the floor. <laughs> Thank you, PJ, and welcome to everyone for this power session and extra roundtable discussion on maximizing the opportunities of beyond the meter commerce. As PJ mentioned, I'm David Wagman, and I'll be your moderator for today's session, which is produced by Energy Central and sponsored by American Water, Homeowner Services, and IBEX. Uh, first of all, we'll start off with a thank you to our sponsors. American Water Homeowner Services is a division of American Water, the largest publicly traded water utility in the United States. American Water Homeowner Services provides custom-designed warranty programs designed specifically for utilities that protect homeowners and their budgets from the high cost of home repair. The company partners with utilities and municipalities to, to provide value-added services that increase customer satisfaction while generating non-usage revenue. And IBEX is a global CLX leader, connecting the world's leading brands with their customers. The company specializes in delivering powerful customer engagement and insight solutions to amplify their value to customers. IBEX utility practice builds custom solutions for the entire life cycle from new connections and a fully stocked e-commerce marketplace to drive incremental revenue in CSAP to all channel digital outreach and enterprise class voice of the customer and survey solutions that deliver customer intelligence. IBEX helps clients build the modern utility CX their customers demand. With me today for this power session are three thought leaders who will join me in an open discussion of Beyond the Meter services and offerings. Our panel members today are Rob Gilpin, Director of Business Development for American Water, Russ Henderson, Senior Research Manager with Chartwell, and Mark Wilkinson, Senior Vice President of Products for IBEX Digital. For more than 25 years, Rob Gilpin has been helping utilities, including Georgia Power, Eversource, Ameren, Encore, Avista, Alabama Power, Alliant Energy, Excel Energy, JEA, and OUC, improve both customer experience and customer engagement. In his current role at American Water Homeowner Services, he is Director of Business Development. In that role, Rob works closely with both electric and gas utilities by assisting them in developing or enhancing they're behind the meter solutions as a way of generating non-usage revenue while also increasing customer satisfaction. Rob, welcome to this Energy Central Power Session. Thanks, David. Glad to be here. Russ Henderson tracks trends and identifies best practices proven to help utility companies become and remain leaders in customer satisfaction and customer experience through industry and consumer surveys, interviews, and group problem solving. Russ facilitates Chartwell's Outage Communications Leadership Council, a utility-only peer group, and serves as content advisor for Chartwell's Power Up Outage Communication Conference. Russ, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, David. Glad to be here. And Mark Wilkinson has been helping utilities and their customer experience teams transform customer journeys, decode uh, customer insights and enhance revenues for nearly 15 years. At IBEX, he leads the teams delivering customer experience and e-commerce solutions for utilities and other regulated industries, specializing in, amplify, in amplifying the connection between businesses and their customers. Mark, it's a pleasure to welcome you as well. And I think that we'll just have to listen to you today because uh, we're having some, some technical difficulties with, uh, with the camera, but welcome to you. 
Thank you very much. Yeah, I think my camera saw my hair this morning and promptly broke. So I apologize for not being there uh, electronically. That happens. Glad to have you here. Now, before we get underway, let me invite our live audience to ask questions of our panel. Uh, uh, we'll take our first questions in maybe 15 minutes or so. Uh, I can either read your question or you may ask it yourself. I'll uh, give you that option. So let's get started. Uh, Rob, Russ, and Mark, uh, I want to begin by talking a bit about what we mean by Beyond the Meter programs. Uh, Russ and Mark, I'll ask you to chime in as well, but Rob, I wonder if you could kick things off by talking a bit about the evolving Beyond the Meter landscape for utilities. Sure, I'd be happy to, David. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. I think just based on, I know, you know, we've had a lot of webcasts uh, over the last nine or uh, 10 or so months, uh, thanks to COVID, um, and uh, had great success in partnering with Energy Central. Uh, I think it's it's really important to note, just based on this topic, that I mean, this has been the most well attended webcast that I've been a part of in really the last couple of years, even before COVID. So I think we've kind of hit a, a strong mark in that. Beyond the meter solutions have one, they've been around for a long time. People don't really realize this, but you know, the 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 the, the, the ability for utilities to provide these non-usage, you know, revenue generating type programs have really been around for a hundred plus years. Utilities early on recognize the importance of selling things like appliances, um, devices that would in fact consume more of their, their own services, but then also the importance of now that we're selling devices, it, you know, it's important to be able to service those devices. So beyond the meter, although that, that terminology appears to be pretty new to most people um it's the concept itself is is not new at all utilities have been doing this for clearly well over 100 years uh, russ will talk a good bit today about the prevalence of marketplaces and mark will chime in a lot as well you know when marketplaces came on the uh sort of the scene about four or five years ago um it was more of a revolution than an evolution. And the fact that so many utilities have already deployed marketplace sites. So again, you know, although the term terminology may sound a little new and different, this kind of uh, idea beyond the meter, it, it, the concept itself is, is not, not new at all. And in fact, so you know, we've been providing these type of services primarily through warranty programs for 28 years. We actually built our business for our own internal customers by you know, the fact that we're utility owned and have been for 28 years. Our programs and products and services were essentially designed for our own internal customers, excuse me, first and foremost, and, and stayed that way for about 10 years. It was only at that point that we really started opening up the channels to go beyond our own customer base. So, you know, we've learned a lot during those initial years and, and we actually learned all of that with our own customer base. So again, for utilities that currently don't offer any type of beyond the meter programs, um, you know, th that that's that's okay. Utilities are, you know, not generally the first ones to adopt or adapt to, to new emerging technologies, and that's just part of our industry. But I think at the same time, that's why so many of your customers really trust your brand, and and you know, you have that 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 loyalty. So I think when you look at you know companies like Nicor, Vectron, OUC, Duke Consumers, DTE, FPNL. Uh, National Grid, Dominion, SMUD, Tico, these are all companies that have, you know, very large recognizable utilities that have been offering these programs quite successfully for a long time. Now we're even seeing emerging technologies or companies like First Energy Home or Dominion's Bright Suite um, uh, offering where, you know, they're a, a regulated company is now sort of spinning off a deregulated organization to offer these types of programs in-house. And we'll talk a little bit down the road in this conversation between sort of the conundrum of build versus buy. But so, you know, behind the meter programs are not new at all. They've been extremely successful. Utilities do them primarily for two, two real reasons, two key reasons. One, to generate customer satisfaction or improve CSAT. And, and there's a lot of good analytics that, that talk about that from companies like Chartwell or JD Power. We've done a lot of our own surveys um, through Russell Research out of Philadelphia for many, many years now. But you know, the, the, the first of the two value adds is utilities are looking for ways of improving customer satisfaction. Secondly, they're looking for ways of generating non-usage revenue. And you know, COVID has certainly um, uh, expedited that. 
but you know, I think through a lot of our own successes through energy efficiency programs, for example, you know, they're working. And in fact, that's that's really had a big impact on you know reducing carbon footprints and, and saving energy, but at the same time, it kind of makes it tough for some utilities' bottom lines. Debt forgiveness programs, we'll talk about that in just a little bit as well, and how you know it was the right thing to do when COVID hit, but you know it's going to be really hard, if not impossible, for a lot of your customers to, to pay that back. So, you know, th there's never been a better time in the utility industry as a whole to find new new programs that that build off of your trust, build off of your brand, allow you to improve customer satisfaction and generate non-usage revenue and significant revenue at that that we'll talk about coming up um, in, 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 in large dollars. I think, and then finally, David, is that you know, from, from our perspective, and, and most of our products and services evolve around conventional home warranties, water, gas, electric, you know, line services, in-home services, appliances, HVAC, et cetera. That's what we built our industry on. Um, but that industry is changing. And we'll talk a little bit more as, the, as we get into the kind of the, the body of this uh, conversation about kind of where, where things are going next and, and what the future of Beyond the Meter looks like. But just a couple of key points that I wanted to share with our audience. One, you know, we're as, as Americans, we're staying in our homes longer. Well, it used to be about a 10 year average for home ownership is now changed to 13 years. And that number will probably increase. Secondly, homes are aging. Um, you know what? Now the average home I think is about 38, 37 years uh, old. A lot of Americans just have a hard time coming up with the money to pay for you know costly repairs. Um, conventional warranty programs are much like any other insurance type program. You pay a small amount per month so that in the event that you do have a large costly repair, that that program will kick in and and, and not only protect. The homeowner and their their appliances and, and you know HVAC systems etc. But they protect your budgets as well. 16% um, of all Americans are now 65 years of age or older. So fixed income becomes more and more of a challenge for people. Um, a lot of banking information just showing how. Um, users are having a hard time you know making a payment or you know a cost of a repair of a thousand dollars or more how challenging that is for for about half of all u.s citizens and that that would have to be paid for either via credit card or you'd have to borrow money in some way and then also look at what's happened with our homes since COVID has struck and that you know our homes now have become our offices and our schools and senior care facilities and so the demand on the home and the appliances and infrastructure on the home has become increasingly more viable and valuable as well. So, you know, fact is, is that this is a conversation we've been having for about 100 years, but really until today, literally this conversation, there's never been a viable conduit to talk about what beyond the meter is what the benefits are, who's doing it, why they're doing it, um, and, and why if you currently aren't experiencing or, or participating, why you should at least be looking at that, what that journey is and does short term and long term. David, I'll send it back to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for the opening remarks, and you, and you lay out very uh, succinctly the, uh, the the range of topics that we're going to be talking about today. And Mark Wilkinson from IDEX, I wonder if, if you could chime in and uh, uh, talk about the uh, your perspective on the uh, evolving uh, market for beyond the meter services. What are you seeing from IDEX? Yeah, certainly. You know, it's anytime I bring new members on my team, they're always a little bit surprised to hear and to learn that. Um, utilities actually are some of the earliest cross-promotional programs um, in the United States. Uh, as, as Rob said, some of these programs have been around for more than 100 years. Electrification, um, you know, selling appliances was a means to get electrification broadly accepted in the community. So, um, you know, a lot of the team members that are, are new to the utility segment on, on my group are, you know, sort of surprised to learn that utilities have been a big factor in those beyond the meter programs literally since the beginning of the, of the industry. Um, we see a lot of evolving changes. We see, you know, a lot of, um, of uh, utilities start, start Starting to embrace the marketplace idea um, and and being you know somewhat disappointed with maybe the results or they um, have an expectation of a certain amount of customer acquisition or, or customer integration and then you know being um, disrupted a little bit by regulatory regimes and and their ability to actually connect with customers we look at beyond the meter programs especially um, on an ongoing basis throughout a life cycle 
as a perfect incubator for customer engagement and CSAT programs and enhancement of, say, energy efficiency and demand response and other program enrollments to connect the utility more closely with their customers and develop real insights into how the, the evolving customer base wants to interact with utilities. So we see this as a real incubator and a great opportunity to kind of springboard. Um, also, you know, in, in where utilities have um, in, in the commodity product range, where they have a, a an almost monopoly relationship with with most of their customers, having a beyond the meter program, having an, a, an off bill or, or an on bill non commodity revenue means that there's a different level of customer service expectation, and it's a great place for everyone, both the utility and the consumer, to learn how to interact in a in a modern fashion because those. Those customer expectations keep amplifying. We all see the research. We all deal with the challenges that we face with with changing needs of our customers and changing expectations of our customers. And um, it's you know in those in those um, sales and uh, and support environments, we really learn a great deal about our customers. So we we see this as a as a great expectation or a, or a great platform rather for for customer expectations to be fulfilled in new ways for the utility as well. Mm -hmm. And Mark, you, you raised a great point about uh, this being all about uh, customer expectations and the relationship with customers. Uh, Russ Henderson from Chartwell, I want to ask you, I was looking at your um, at Chartwell's uh, 2020 residential uh, consumer survey, and uh, one of the findings was that half of consumers, if they were given the choice, would change their utility if another company offered lower prices. Uh, I wonder if you could talk in a bit more detail about characteristics of things like e-commerce and home warranty offerings um, and how they can change the relationship with customers. What does your research at Chartwell tell us about that relationship and strengthening it? Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, as Rob and, and Mark have uh, have already talked about, you know, uh, utilities are, are looking at beyond the meter programs. They've got a lot of different motivators for moving in that direction, flat demand and so forth. And they're kind of re-examining their role in, in customers' lives. And uh, customer expectations have extended beyond reliable service to include uh, increased energy efficiency, reducing carbon emissions and so forth. Um, and of course you have the, the movement of uh, Google and Amazon and others into the space and in the other direction, like Rob's mentioned, uh, regulated companies are spinning off into deregulated areas. And uh, you know, utilities are having to think about loyalty and, and uh, customer satisfaction in, in a much more immediate way than they have in the past, right? They're not just looking at them as uh, rate payers. And our research shows that customers are much more satisfied and loyal uh, to their utility when they participate in these beyond the meter programs, when they actually use a marketplace. Uh, in fact, we find that the more touch points there are with the utility between the utility customer and the utility, the higher the satisfaction tends to be, the, you know, kind of building your brand. And uh, utility marketplaces offer an avenue to kind of expand that relationship with, uh, with customers. And uh, yeah, we definitely see a, a huge relationship between uh, loyalty and satisfaction. If you uh, if you guys wouldn't mind, would you share? Uh, let me see, slide 17. Kind of give you a bit bigger picture view of the utility customer relationship today. Here are a few takeaways from the report that David was mentioning. 54% um, of utility customers are uh, would would be willing to switch uh, utilities if they had the option. Most of them, of course, don't have that option but they, they would if they could for a lower price. That's the way we ask it in our consumer survey. Um, and uh, <clears throat> of course, customers' loyalty we find can be swayed uh, if you increase their satisfaction and the ease of doing business. And we also find that highly satisfied customers are nearly two times more likely to stay than low satisfaction customers. And uh, if you guys could go to uh, slide 18. Uh, while it's true that most utilities customers don't have a, a choice, um, like I said, there are a number of uh, actors in the industry today that we haven't really seen before. There's one in particular that uses marketing that sort of uh, leads people to believe that they can provide clean power while their utility provides dirty power, right? And, they can, and they're trying to kind of get in between the utility and the utility customer and kind of take over that relationship. Um, and of course, uh, many, many customers are kind of signing over that relationship with those people. Um, so loyalty is, of course, very important. As you can see here, uh, about 46% would stay no matter what, which is actually really good if you think about it. That's actually pretty, 
pretty fantastic loyalty. Um, um, and that is even higher if you go to slide 19 when you take a, a look at high satisfaction customers versus low satisfaction customers. We asked um, uh, our survey respondents to rate their satisfaction with their utility on a scale of one to five. And we split up those, those people into two different groups, the high satisfaction on the right here and the low satisfaction on the left. And you, as you can see, the high satisfaction customers, 60, about 65%, or 64, 65% said they would stay um, with their utility even if they had another option. And low satisfaction customers, about 65%, about the same percentage would leave if they had the choice. So this is definitely um, uh, something that um, uh, utilities uh, need to, uh, this is a really good indicator of satisfaction and, and, and the importance of loyalty and satisfaction for uh, utilities. And we do find, as I said, that there is a big relationship between uh, customer satisfaction and building that loyalty and using products and services that utilities offer, not just the standard things that they offer, like you know, e-bill, ways to save money, outage push alerts, these kinds of things, but also beyond the meter, marketplaces have an even higher uh, impact on customer satisfaction than these other conventional utility uh, products and services. Yeah. Russ brings up some really good points here. If I if I could jump in for a second, because he's, he's really talking about the value of that digitally engaged customer. And um, and we're talking about loyalty, not retention. And this is also a little bit of a difficult concept in some circles where, you know, customers don't have choice. So so the idea of retention is not the issue, but it's it's really about loyalty. Um, it's about the the customer who's loyal to the brand um, and isn't going to be dissuaded just about price. So customers that don't show a lot of loyalty, they're they're not demonstrating a lot of loyalty. On Russ's last slide, showed that it was really customers would would bolt over a price issue any any lower price meaning it's really just a commodified relationship um, and what you're finding where there's good brand amplification where there's where there's a high csat those are loyal customers they're not going to be dissuaded just by price and if you think about um, you know the benefit of say a beyond the meter program um, a customer who's been able to purchase a, 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 a programmable thermostat is saving a little bit of money on their electric bill. They, they're getting um, you know, an email newsletter that tells them how to save money or how to be more green. Or in, in many cases, they're finding things like water conservation from an electric utility. So they're, they're learning how to stay connected in their home, get more value or more uh, protection for their home, um, you know, save a little bit of money using a thermostat. Even more importantly, in the in the service contract world, being able to get a repair and protection plan, say, um, you know, that that protects their consumer electronics. They may have purchased it through their utility, and now, you know, the mobile device that I carry around every day has a protection plan on it. I'm I, as a customer, I'm much happier in that kind of engagement. Um, I'm more likely to take advantage of a claim and and the happiest person on earth is the person who has has filed a claim and and recovered you know some some support or gotten a repair taken care of um, and the the benefit there goes directly to the utility the utility gets the the brand amplification and the customer satisfaction investment from the consumer so it, it doesn't surprise anyone when they think about it that way but it is a you know that that term loyalty is so critical in that equation Mm -hmm. And I think you know one thing that kind of works against the utility industry as a whole is that we've gotten so good at providing you know our 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 products and services consistently that you know for most customers you really don't think about your utility because the services you know generally it always works 99.999 percent of the time there are those instances where we have outages but you know I mean it, most outages are typically caused by an act of God you know a, a, a lightning strike or a you know significant storm but it, it gives utilities very little because of their reliability factor overall, it gives utilities very little opportunity to reach out and, and communicate or touch that customer, you know, for the vast majority of that relationship. So I think these type of programs, you know, provide utilities a great ability to have multiple touch points and doing, you know, providing value added services, you know, and, and continually kind of fostering that that great relationship and not just you know not just because the power's out <laughs>
or you got a high bill all of a sudden. So I think it really provides a great conduit to better engage and communicate with your customers under normal circumstances where you really don't have that opportunity 98, 99% of the time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, we're already getting some good questions in from our live audience today. And we're gonna be moving to uh, our first round of those questions in just a minute. But before we do that, uh, we wanted to do maybe a little a little benchmark with the live audience. And, and PJ, if you could bring up the um, the poll that we asked, we just wanted to kind of get an idea of where um, our audience is in the, in, in the journey towards offering uh, Beyond the Meter program. So if you'd like to take part uh, and uh, just fill it in really quickly, what we'll do is we're gonna take a couple of questions and then uh, when we get back to the discussion, we'll take a look at the at the uh, survey results and, and get some common uh, some commentary around it. So um, we, we had just a, one question was um, kind of a definitional uh, uh, question to start with. And, and, and maybe, Rob, I can give this to you to, to start with. Uh, the question is, we keep using the, 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 the term marketplace. Can, can you give a firm example of what that is? Sure. And I think actually, I'd love to take a shot at that, but I think Mark is more qualified. Mark, why don't you take that one? Okay. <laughs> uh, so sure. Um, uh, when we use the term marketplace, we're really talking about an e-commerce site uh, that's been branded or in, offered in partnership with uh, a utility. So a, a site like firstenergyhome.com, for example, um, there's a number of them out there. Um, some are branded with the utility, some are independently branded, but basically an e-commerce portal where the utility can offer new products and services beyond the meter to their customers. Uh -huh. Great, okay, all right. Russ, does that resonate with you? Does that make sense? Yes, that, that's pretty much the same definition that uh, that we use at Chartwell. Yeah, yep. we define an online utility marketplace as a, you know, e-commerce, a web-based store offering, uh, you know, energy efficient products, appliances, uh, you know, um, smart home devices, services, along, things along those lines. They can be hosted by a utility or by a you know, utility partner. Um, yeah, and we find that uh, uh, we, about 30%, maybe a little bit more than 30% of the industry right now, but about the 150 or so largest utilities in the US and Canada are offering a uh, marketplace now. Uh, PJ, I think Russ has a great slide. Could you could you find, I don't have the number in front of me, but that uh, the slide that shows all the different utilities that are incorporating, that have already incorporated marketplaces, that's a really good slide. 20, 26. Lucky 26. Slide 26, <laughs> not the number 20, not, not 26 utilities, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. There it is. Yeah. Yeah, we did an audit. This was uh, last year. We went uh, we went through the, the research that we did on uh, marketplaces. Um, I've known Rob Gilpin for a number of uh, years, and he he along with a number of others uh, in the industry encouraged us at Chartwell to really kind of dig into this marketplaces uh, area a little bit more deeply. And we did an audit, which is to say, we visited websites, we did interviews, you know, and uh, we talk to the the biggest utilities in the industry. Chartwell's been around for nearly th nearly 30 years now. We have, you know, relationships with all the big utilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is what we um this is what we came up with, yeah. And um we found um um I, I th we also found that a number of utilities are were planning on launching uh, marketplaces. So I think we're going to see the, uh, a pretty good amount of growth in this area over the next couple of years. With COVID now, it makes it a little bit, you know, all, all the uh, the new rollouts have become a little bit uh, less predictable than they were before. Uh, but uh, I think we're definitely going to uh, see a lot more, a lot of growth in this direction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And Russ, let me stick with you for just another minute. Uh, both both Sergio and uh, Stephanie are asking kind of the same similar kind of questions. Uh, uh, is there any re research or what, what insights can you offer about which specific behind the meter products or services build the most loyalty with customers? Well, our our research so far has has really focused on marketplaces. Right now, we haven't uh, gone into depth with other things that much. Um, but we do find, if you want to um, go to slide 20, I can share a little uh, information here just for context, and then I'll talk about the impact of, uh, of marketplaces. On slide 20, we're, th this is where we're, we're talking about the impact and satisfaction of, of lots of different uh, you know, products and services, offerings from utilities on satisfaction and the perception of ease of doing business. And what the percentages here, the change in satisfaction, the change in ease is, is the, uh, the boost upward 
of uh, satisfaction or the perception of ease of doing business of just awareness uh, that their utility offers these things. That is offering ways to save money, outage push alerts, e-bill, um, e-pay, and so and so forth. And as you can see here, uh, customers like to save money. Um, that's a surprise, right? Um, and uh, push alerts, outage push alerts, have a huge impact. Uh, those are the two that have kind of the biggest impact. Um, yeah, outage push alerts, for example, are an interesting one. About 85% of the uh, the industry offers push alerts. Only about 39, 38% of customers are aware of that, right? So mm -hmm. that's that's an example of, of a, a big opportunity. If you marketed your outage push alerts even more, then you'd get a boost, not just from them actually using them, but from being aware of them. And it's the same with marketplaces. Um, even more dramatic, actually, if you go to the next slide, um, consumers who use marketplaces are actually uh, more satisfied, 14% more satisfied. So the impact of using a marketplace or just being aware of, uh, of that their utility offers a marketplace has a, a much more dramatic Im impact than really conventional products and services from util for, that utilities offer, which is a very surprising um, uh, result that we got. Uh -huh. So yeah, 14% boost in satisfaction just from using a, a uh, marketplace and 8% boost just from being aware that their utility offers one. Yeah. And David, I, can I jump in real quick? And uh, PJ, if you would go to uh, slide six for a second. So I won't spend much time here, but this is, um, I, I find this very interesting and, and I hope you will too. So this is four different large customers of ours, as you can see, you know, a number of meters ranging from 430,000 all the way up to 2.2 million. My, my point in this is the, uh, the percentage of penetration or participation, if you will. You know, if you were to look at our 35 plus utility clients uh, across the board, the average participation rate is 26.5%. So what, what I can promise you is that you know, I we know within American Homeowner Homeowner Services that we can get 25% of your customers to, to participate in, and these are just our conventional programs. We've now offer starting to offer a variety of virtual programs, some enhanced programs on top of this that are really designed to, to fit nicely, dovetail nicely with your marketplace site. So, you know, we to answer that question, we know that we can get, you know, every bit of 25% of your, your customer base to participate. And then uh, PJ, if you'd go to the next slide, number seven, the problem is, is, is that, you know, what's the old saying, if you build it, they will come. Uh, what was that? Field, Field of Dreams. Great movie. Um, the problem is that's not that's not necessarily the case. There are a lot of utilities that have great marketplace out there, but you're really hard pressed to find them. Um, you know, same with outage maps or other types of technologies. You can't just build it and then stick it somewhere and, and you know, and be surprised why customers aren't flocking to it. They, in many instances, they can't find it. So there are a lot of factors that go into the marketing of any of these beyond the meter services. And I think it's just important to point that out. And, and the three in red are, are to, to us after our 28 years of history are really the most important. The ability to brand, uh, or co-brand at least, just to you know, even if it's just a simple recommendation on Bill, as Mark I think had already pointed out, obviously you know really helps to cement a, a partnership deal if you are partnering with a third-party vendor. And then we'll talk a little bit more down the road in this presentation about the move call and how that really is the most influential, most powerful marketing tool that you have when you've got that customer, that new customer that's starting service or the customer that's transferring service. When you've got one or two minutes on the phone with that you know individual after the onboarding process has taken place that by far is the most influential kind of marketing tool that you've got yep 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 Ab absolutely and, and if i could magnify that a little, a yep. little bit on on the oh go ahead david I'm, I'm sorry oh no no go ahead i was just going to have uh pj see if she could queue up the uh the results from our uh, polls because uh, that's that's kind of interesting too and, and and russ go ahead and then we can take a look at the at the poll results Okay, yeah, just to, to magnify that, that's uh, the importance of marketing that uh, Rob was talking about is absolutely uh, paramount. We, we found in our, our research of, on marketplaces that only 11% of, uh, of utility customers have actually used a marketplace, but we found that uh, 
that uh, nearly 50% were interested in using a marketplace, right? And yep. if you were marketing to those people, then they would be uh, you know, much more likely to actually use them. And then of course that would boost your, your customer satisfaction. Yeah, it's, uh, the only thing I would add, in, and it's great to see the quick poll um, is, and, and and in getting back to the question of, you know, are there products or services that lend themselves to loyalty or CSAT more? Um, what I would suggest is that it's a combination of, of all of them that reaches the highest CSAT um, that, you know, currently, and, and Russ literally wrote the book on this topic, um, in terms of the research that he and Chartwell have been able to conduct is, and we've been talking around it, but there are, you know, 30% of utilities have some form of a marketplace. Zero of our participants are actually thinking about marketplace sites, except that they're thinking about other products that you would generally want to offer. Um, the question becomes, you know, what are the right products and services and how do you engage with customers? Customers are looking for marketplaces. They're looking for, an, you know, a, a quick, easy way to get connected to a, a service provider to find what they're looking for. And the utility has an incredibly credible voice in that. What we always advise customers is, uh, you know, our, our utility clients is you've got to find a way to leverage that first critical experience with the consumer, your, your new connection. Right. It's a great bridge to sell, um, you know, beyond the meter products and services, non-commodity products and services that will get high CSAT. But then you've got to create an ecosystem where the customer can come back and re-engage with, with the brand uh, on a repeated basis. And the only way to do that is if you've got a place for them to go, a destination portal like an e-commerce or a mar you know, site or a marketplace, and then have a, a range of new products and services often interconnected that the consumer can trust coming from the utility that you know they'll they'll give the utility permission to offer them um, those products and services and then there's a place where the utility you know the consumer can buy them so i think this is a really interesting poll to to connect the dots on that yeah great good 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 and and you know russ i uh, just to uh, you know quote, quote some more chart well research since we're doing that today i was interested in uh, uh, in your report uh, from september to show that uh, you know around almost 60 percent of utilities said they had a mobile app and 91 of those apps included the functionality for customers to make payments, but only about 9% of customers uh, say that they were using that mobile app to uh, uh, to pay their bills. So it gets kind of this disconnect and, you know, you're, you're offering it, but but they may not use it. And, and I'm wondering, you know, I want to I want to move into uh, kind of the next uh, phase of our of our discussion and talk a little bit in more detail about e-commerce delivery options and platform architectures and how those can help play a role and how those get selected. And, and Mark, I wonder if you could uh, get us started uh, by talking about some of the approaches to evaluating objectives and selecting a, a delivery platform. Certainly, and, and I have to, I, I reference that stat from, from Russ's team quite a lot. It's not surprising um, when you think about the number of people that really are using um, mobile apps to pay their bills, but it's almost always the banking app, right? It's it's almost never the vendor app. It's almost always the banking app because it, they make it really easy. It's very seamless. And banks are on the forefront of that. Financial services and internet companies are some of the most highly aligned to what their digital enabled customers want. Um, and that's an area that utilities have struggled with. There's some research that's, you know, most customers expect a little bit more from their utility in regards to the website you know they want more functionality from the website um, they want more offers from the website more communication from the website uh, it has to be cleaner they're looking for more um, of a modern uh, interface um, and that's where you you know in any commerce portal can really create some value for utilities um, there are a number of good ones out there uh, it, there's always a buy versus build question um, and having been in the industry on both sides of the equation for a long time i can generally say that um, no one should ever try to build something unless it's their core competency. So it's easy for a software company to say, hey, we'll build it. It's not necessarily the best thing for anybody else to try and do that, um, and especially as more and more of the services are now available in the cloud um, and you can depend on a partner to um, be in that space as their core competency. Um, I would say most companies benefit, not, not in utilities per particularly, but most companies benefit from looking for a service provider to help with these things. If not, 
on a build or lease basis, at least on an advisory basis. Um, I think a lot of um, the the marketplace has shifted, you know, um, even for very large brands to to partner with the technology companies that deliver these types of services. So, you know, the most easy example is Shopify. Um, and Magento and WooCommerce, some partners that deliver e-commerce portals, but they do it in you know a more generic fashion. Um, and then there are specialty organizations. Ibex happens to be one of them where we really tailor for particular industries, and where we we spend a little bit more time thinking about services. Um, products are fairly easy to do, but complex services are a little bit more difficult. And what utilities need to focus on, and what we advise is is always to try and make the interaction that the customer has as seamless as possible. It's just gotta be easy. Um, so making it easy to find products and services, making it easy to find information to help advise on a, you know, help make a purchase decision or make a claim if you've purchased a solution. Um, it really becomes a whole ecosystem that, um, you know, that customers are expecting. And unfortunately, you know, unless you're in the business on a day-to-day -day basis, it's very hard to keep up with those expectations, let alone meet them. Um, so we generally, from a technology perspective, w would recommend that that a you know a, a customer, a client that's new in the space, look to uh, to lease these options through some form of SaaS play, um, a, a software as a service, or or, or work with a, a dedicated partner on those types of solutions, then try to build it themselves. Mm -hmm. And if, if I can add something to that, about it, it does look like about eighty, more than eighty percent of the utilities that are offering uh, online marketplaces are doing it in partnership with, uh, you know, with somebody for whom that is their core competency. And for those who are kind of doing uh, their marketplace on their own, uh, just to share this with you. When we were doing our audits, some, sometimes we had to call people to find out if they had an online marketplace. <laughs> uh, just to let you know, we couldn't find it until they sent us a link. We weren't able to find it. So that's just an example. That was that happened with a few utilities. Yeah, it, you know, we, it was interesting. Uh, to Russ's point, we were at a show a couple of years ago, and I met um, I met four or five different vendors that offered e-commerce portals for utilities, and they all had this. You know, two of them had the same logo. Um, on their brochures, on their collateral, meaning two different companies were supplying the same utility with two different portals, two different marketplaces. And mm -hmm. I and I spent some time on the on the the um, the the utility site to try and find it, and I couldn't find it. And it really does go back to something. And Rob had a good slide on it just a moment ago in terms of the ecosystem and multi-channel. Um, and and the the quote from Field of Dreams is exactly right. There's plenty of we talk to clients all the time about this. Um, you know, especially new clients who are interested in e-commerce, it's like, well, I built an e-commerce portal. Why aren't my customers buying anything from me? Uh, and too often, what we find is, you know, that link to Russ's to, to Russ's comment. It's impossible to find. It's not a brand name or a domain that makes sense to the consumer because we we all we're all e-commerce consumers ourselves. We all know what to expect. And so, if we if the if the steps to get to a marketplace or an e-commerce portal are you know, very different from our normal habits, customers just won't get there. Um, and and so it really does take a, you know, an ease of doing business, a frictionless system and a regular level of engagement through through email and through social and through referral to help your customers find and, and re, you know, come back to those sites. I've, I've got a couple of, um, I've got a couple of slides if you wanna jump to slide 10. Um, you know, these are just some of the basic elements of e-commerce and marketplace technology that that utilities or any any company considering this should really should really keep front of mind. And um, you know, one of which is you've got to be mobile friendly. Uh, this is a, a slide from Statista, but um, the share of e-commerce sales from mobile devices, tablets, and phones has has this year you know reached about 50%. It's expected to go above 53% next year. And the traffic loads in some of our sites that we're we're uh, hosting for utilities is over 70% for mobile devices. So you've got to be mobile friendly because that's how customers are engaged. That doesn't mean you you need a mobile app. That goes back to Russ's earlier point, which was, you know, only nine percent of consumers are regularly using a utility's mobile app. Mobile apps are are great for companies where you know daily, weekly, monthly use is something that the consumers are are habituated to. But if you have a mobile enabled website, if you think about being mobile friendly first, 
easy phone numbers to get to, click to call or click to chat, text-based capabilities, you know, simple visuals. That's really where the, the e-commerce um, end of the spectrum is, is moving. And if you flip to, uh, I think, slide 11, you, you want to try and have as many products and services there as you can, um, you know it's it's no longer a uh, it's no longer a technical hurdle to offer products and services, um, and so if you can if you can put products and services in your marketplace, this gives your customer a reason to come back. Um, and and this is an important. It's not part of the technology as much as the offer, where you've got an you know you've got a place where customers now are aware that the utility can offer new services, aware that there's new and interesting things to, to um, you know, engage with, um, but you wanna maintain some variety there and, and be as expansive as possible. Uh, and then I think slide 12, not to beat the slides to death, um, but you know, from a technology perspective, and we, go, we keep going back to how do we get customers into these portals to begin with, um, email is the best distribution channel, but it's also the hardest for, for some utilities to be able to engage on, you know, making it easy for that new customer, you know, right after that new customer experience, they've, they've created a, you know, a new energy start or a, a new service enrollment, giving them a, a reason to come into that ePortal and, and um, capture their email, invite the customer to provide their email to opt in for future engagement. That starts the, the life cycle of that digital engagement, that, of that digital customer experience. And now you've got a customer that's now, you know, going to be able to open your email. They're going to be reading, you know, energy efficiency information or conservation information or home improvement and repair and protection information, you know, how to get more value out of their home. Those are all topics that are going to give the, the customer a good reason to come back into your portal. And, and the utilities now got, you know, that digital dialogue rolling, if that makes sense. I think the, yeah, in short, the, 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 key word is, the, the key word here is just value add, regardless as to what beyond the meter program you're, uh, you know, you're considering, and, and maybe this will be a good segue back to the results of the poll, which I, I thought that was really interesting in terms of the results. But, you know, the, the key here, folks, to any of these programs is value add. Make sure that they're valuable. This is not a contest to see who can check as many boxes as possible, just to say that, you know, we, you know, now we offer a mobile app, but it's not very good. And now we offer an outage map, but it's not very good. And now we mm -hmm. offer a market place but you'll never find it on our website anyway and you know it, it's all about the value add and I mean you know from from our perspective that's why you know we have a paid claim rate of 97 percent the last thing we want to do with you and your customer is to get into an argument about you know is this really a valid claim or not in most instances 97 percent of the time we're just going to pay the claim because we know it's the right thing to do so you know regardless as to what vendors or vendors uh, plural that you you know you partner with just make sure that they're you know they're highly experienced and they're highly reputable um, I think this is a great opportunity to partner because clearly for utilities this is going beyond your comfort you know sort of your comfort zone of, of you know beyond just providing you know the core fundamentals of utilities but the value add is is I think the real key to making any of these programs work that no matter what what you offer it's got to provide ongoing value to the customer every time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I want to ask, um, and, and uh, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't um, uh, acknowledge the uh, uh, concerns around privacy and around security. And while it's not a not core to our discussion today, I wonder if uh, if we could talk just a bit about um, uh, some of those considerations with uh, with offering these kinds of services and what's top of mind with uh, with utilities as they uh, as they evaluate uh, beyond the meter services in terms of um, of security and uh, and privacy i wonder mark can you uh, can you start the, the the discussion a little bit and, and give some insight yeah certainly I, and i appreciate the question it's a it's a it's a critical one for for certain and the the um the landscape's changing rather, rather dramatically california is leading the charge in terms of consumer privacy uh legislation they're not quite sure how they're going to implement the rules. We're, everybody in the space is, is having to contend with them, but I think there's 13 or 15 states that are looking individually at creating some consumer protection and privacy rules that, that reflect you know, some of the same standards that California is um, bringing into market, which is basically that consumers should be in charge of their own data. 
Um, and so that's absolutely a security concern. I don't know a single utility executive, uh, especially in the CIO and COO's offices, that doesn't you know, lose sleep weekly um, in terms of cybersecurity risks and, and you know, anything they do in the digital space um, you know, without protection could expand that risk. So again, um, the need to partner um, really for both privacy and, and cyber or infosec um, protections, um, it's, it's essential to make sure that when we're taking an, an email from a customer that we're using it properly, that we're, we're not violating any, any rules and regulations, but we're also doing it you know, in a customer friendly fashion. We shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be you know, doing something with that data that the customer wouldn't want, shouldn't be using it for, for the wrong purposes or, or you know, being lax in security about it. Um, and then always um, being able to stay in um, partnership with, with leading technology partners is a way that um, CIOs and COOs can maintain some security, not only of the data integrity, but also the platform integrity. Again, if you're, you know, and this is a, a big reason why SaaS is, is such a, a compelling value in the space, because the cost of maintaining that security, if you're doing it all yourself or on-prem, can be overwhelming. You know, you'll never escape the cost curves um, in a bill versus buy decision. So I think, um, you know, the security aspects certainly make it easier for the partnership to uh, decision to be made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Russ, do you have any insights that you can add or, or Rob? Uh, <clears throat> we've, heard, we've heard similar concerns from our from our members. I'll just say that, and it's certainly true for you know outage maps as well as outage push alerts, things along these lines. The same security uh, and cybersecurity uh, issues uh, kind of uh, prevail. And yeah, partnering. And in these areas, of course, we see similar numbers for utilities partnering with uh, somebody who is who's, who has that sort of expertise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fees can be the, the fees for violations can be rather dramatic. So, <laughs> um, sending a text message, uh, you know, a blast of a of a um, an outage alert uh, with that you don't have permission for can actually create a lot of fines. So it's always always yeah. better to make sure that you're you're staying on on top of those things. Yeah, certainly with that, the, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the FCC decision that came out in 2016, you know, gave utilities a lot of protection where that's uh, concerned. But they still absolutely have to keep their their contact data clean, or they're going to be sending information to a customer that uh, uh, you know they they, they the, so that number's been reassigned, and uh, the the the, yep. the, uh, the safe harbor provision is only one contact. That's all that you have one chance to magically right. know that that number is wrong now, and then you are open up to you know to a TCPA lawsuit. Mm -hmm. That's something to think of. We have some clients of ours of the 35 plus utilities that we currently partner with where, you know, they, they understand the importance and, and we do all of this at our expense, you know, promoting these products and services to the utilities, you know, customer base, primarily their residential customers, homeowners and tenants alike. Um, but sometimes they're um, they're reluctant to just provide us with the list or, or maybe through their PUC, they, they, they can't or won't provide us a list of their customers. So we'll actually just find it, at, you know, kind of with if they're prompting um, a third party organization that, you know, where we'll we'll create the, the marketing content, they'll approve it, then we'll send it to a third party vendor that they select. And then they in turn send the contact list to that same third party. So we actually never see or come in contact with that data. And then same with the uh, credit card payments. You know, we there, and that's a whole different discussion. Um, but you know, through our three call centers, we're you know very careful to make sure that everything that we do is is completely compliant. Um, even our CSRs you know, don't have access to the credit card information. It can be done in such a way. So there are a variety of ways, but it, it's, you know, it's a great conversation. Maybe we could actually put together an entire webcast around security, but there are a lot of great checks and balances that are already in place to ensure compliance and, uh, um, and security. Yeah, David, Rob, Rob brought up some great points and, and they all become key questions for any utility that's considering these types of options those are the questions that they should be asking right so you know pci compliance if you're going to be selling a new product and service it's transacted on a credit card or on the bill are you making sure that you're taking care of that financial and 
personal information um, appropriately. That's that's a key consideration. Any technology, any partner that's going to be doing technology, um, can they can they survive a security audit? Do they have security standards and practices? Are they um, maintaining their their data appropriately? Those are you know the the checklists that a CIO would would engage with. Um, you know, customer satisfaction, compliance reviews, QA, um, quality assurance, and and recordings and things, so that in the event that it, that a customer ever did escalate an issue, does the partner have protection? Is there technology in place to ensure that the both the customer and the utility are going to be favorably disposed? Those are all great questions. They they almost form a checklist for for that partnership interaction. I you know I think Rob makes those points perfectly. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. I want to um, ask also uh, on this issue of uh, on this discussion around uh, uh, platforms, the scalability and uh, what a utility should keep in mind as they uh, begin to implement a, a beyond the meter uh, platform and then think about adding things like, you know, home warranties and appliance repair and marketplace sites, moving relocation services. Uh, what what scaling issues uh, come into play, and, and how do those get uh, get addressed? Uh, uh, Mark, you want to start on that a little bit? Certainly, um, and and this is another reason why why partnering um, makes sense. Because um, if I were if I were setting out today to build my own marketplace, um, and I had uh, you know a half million consumers or or three or four million consumers at scale in my marketplace environment. Um, those cost controls become rather exorbitant if if we're not careful, right? So, um, you know, built working with the proper partners, not just for necessarily for offering the services through an e-commerce portal, right? So you've got to worry about scale of visitors and traffic and and transactions, but then scale if you're if you're successful selling say service contracts, can you support those service contracts? Can you take the claims? Can you handle the the repair administration, do you have a network? All of those kinds of concerns are, are questions that are essential when selecting partners at, the, at that level. You wanna make sure that there's strong quality. Um, and and you know, if, you, if you sold the product, can you, can you support the customer through that life cycle? That journey is essential. It's the first question that, that really the, we recommend utilities start thinking about when we do discovery. Um, we start doing journey exercises to understand, you know, what what is the vision for for supporting that customer? What does that ecosystem begin to look like? And then we layer in the, you know, the care and support um, and uh, and ongoing engagement with the customer. That that turns into how you plan for scale. Uh, and then mm -hmm. and then obviously, you know, being able to keep the customer outreach. It's great to to want a marketplace or to offer new products and services. But if you're not um, prepared to engage regularly with your customer through uh, multiple forms of, of outreach, um, you know you might have a flash of of you know 30, 60, 90 days worth of attention, and then and then long fallow periods where customers, you know, new customers aren't aren't connecting with that site again. So it has to be an ongoing commitment, I think, from from a scale perspective, because you have to achieve some escape velocity, or the program won't won't look like a success. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Rob, do you have any thoughts on the scalability uh, issue? Yeah, it's uh, you know I think for us uh, the the core competency that we bring to the table is is essentially twofold. You know, managing a network of 2,400 different uh, you know uh, uh, technicians and contractors, electricians, plumbers, and uh, HVAC technicians. You know, 2,400 some odd different companies all across the United States, and and constantly adding more. Um, you know, leveraging, there are a lot of moving parts in that, being able to provide a better overall service, you know, for you to call us, for us to dispatch a plumber than for you to go out and find your own plumber. Um, and that and just the call center, you know, another key area, obviously, you know, severe winter weather is going to really impact, you know, uh, uh, you know, heating problems or, or significantly high temperatures for air conditioning. So, I, I mean, just talking to a couple of utilities that offer their own in-house warranty program and how all of a sudden something comes along called COVID and now you know you're you know you've got to figure out how to get your own technicians in this example when you're internal for an internal program you know with all of the safety gear you know now that they're going inside homes 
and you know just little things like that so i think there these some of these programs as mark was alluding to could have a lot of moving parts and is that really your core competency you know i think that's why we you know we do all the heavy lifting for our utility partners their sole job is is just to hold us accountable to the slas and to all of the things that they designed into these custom programs that we built that's their only job just let us do what we do best it's you know we over 28 years we've gotten really good at this and we're continuing to find new programs and services but you know one minute there's you know there's there's no no requests and then all of a sudden you know temperature drops 30 degrees and now you're just bombarded with calls and every one of those is critical and important so just being able to have that that inherent scalability is why we operate three different call centers and we have over 300 csrs um, that are available in 24 hour by seven, you know, assistance, those sort of things, and just learning the hard way over 28 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and uh, I want to, uh, it's a good segue into the, the third part of our discussion, which is to uh, uh, to look at growth drivers for beyond the meter services. And uh, uh, Rob, you bring up the uh, uh, the pandemic and everybody staying at home, and you know, it's uh, uh, there is an opportunity for utilities that uh, that comes about through uh, the the change in the way people are are doing work and living at home. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit to get the discussion uh, going by um, uh, explaining a little bit how the how the uh, pandemic has affected how utilities and customers uh, uh, interact and what expectations are and what some opportunities are uh, for uh, utility beyond the meter programs. Sure, I mean, you know, COVID has, um, it's, it's it, I guess, you know, hopefully we'll be talking about this and learning from this for, you know, many years to come. Um, especially when our children look at pictures from weddings and, and, and social gatherings and ask, why does everybody have a face mask on? You know, let's, let's hope that we can get through this as quickly as possible. But it's certainly been a very challenging year for a lot of reasons. And there are a lot of hurting people out there, people that haven't gotten a paycheck for, you know, six plus years or six plus months. It seems like six plus years. Um, so, you know, debt forgiveness programs and how quickly utilities have adopted to that. But the problem is, is that, you know, it's, it's, if it was to, if it was hard to collect a hundred and fifty dollar utility bill now six months later how hard is it going to be to collect or for the you know your customer to pay a you know a twenty five hundred dollar utility bill especially now that we're getting into the winter months so it's been really hard for a lot of different reasons but at the same time i think you know and every once in a while it takes you know some of these kind of unique situations acts of god we'll call them uh to to really kind of stir things up and and you know we're we're very resilient as a world and, and you know who would have thought that we could have essentially uh, you know moved people tens of uh, millions of people from offices into you know working from home and do so so quickly and so efficiently so i think through the you know all of the challenges of covid we've learned a lot but I think most importantly for our existing customers and for a lot of, you know, this has been our busiest six months ever out of 28 years because utilities are looking for ways of helping their customers, knowing that their customers need a lot of help. Um, PJ, could you go to slide number five? And I'll just quickly touch base on this, but there are a lot of great benefits through these value add programs in terms of improving customer SAT, but let's just talk about from a revenue perspective. And, you know, again, there were what we, I think we hit 300, 301 registrations for this, this webcast today, this power session. Not all of you are currently on the line with us right now, but obviously it's been it's a very popular topic. We certainly figured that out. Um, and there are a lot of large utilities on board as well. Um, so let's just say that you you're a utility with a, a million meters. Um, I mentioned 26.5% participation, right? Let's just use 20% because it's an easy, easy number. But my question would be, what could you do with $4 million a year in net new revenue, non-usage related, you know, what kind of goodness and cheer and love could you could you spread around with that kind of money? It's not, you know, it's not going to put you on the cover of Inc. magazine, but, you know, even at $2 million, if you only have half a million meters, you know, think of the debt forgiveness programs or as you adopt some of these beyond the meter programs and let your customers know that every dollar that's generated a profit made from these programs goes to you know to fund other internal programs such as a covid relief program or low income programs or debt forgiveness programs so that you know as i 
I, I don't need the help uh, as a particular customer, but by signing up for these programs, I know that I am helping. So it a, becomes a win-win in, in that scenario. So I think there, you know, COVID has certainly kind of forced forced our hand to become, you know, to become different, to think differently. Uh, a little bit of love, a little bit of goodwill, I think goes a long, long way at, at, at this time. And, you know, what what that kind of money could do, I think is is really phenomenal out there to help, you know, with, with zero investment from the utility, by the way, you know, if you could find services or programs that provide value to your customers and in turn generate some money that you could either use above the line or below the line, however you, maybe ultimately long after COVID's gone, it, it prevents a, a use case. Or, you know, so there's so many different ways. It's wonderful to see our customers and how they've reinvested these, these funds um, in the many, many different ways. So I think COVID has, has been a real challenge for a lot of people for six, eight long months. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's brought us together. It's forced us to think differently. Utilities are, we're not the quickest to adapt to new technologies or try new things, but you know, that's, that's okay. The fact that as long as you know we are always kind of pushing forward, and you know it's it's okay to uh, uh, to just think a little outside of the box and to try some of these programs. And I think as we kind of start to wrap the program up, and we'll talk a little bit about implementation, you know, try a pilot, um, even just an internal pilot. Take some of these programs and just try them internally on your own customer, your your employees, and let those your customers as well. You know, what a great way to ease into kind of a phased implementation or just, you know, a crawl, walk, run. So I think COVID has certainly thrown us, uh, you know, some some wicked um, uh, changes in, in, the, the, in, in our world as a whole. But I think it's also made us better in a variety of ways, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ross Henderson from Chartworld, is, does your research uh, shed any additional light on uh, kind of uh, the, the increased um, uh, interest uh, in some of the drivers that, that we're seeing this year over the past, you know, six, nine months? Uh, thank you, Rob, certainly uh, touched on the, the financial difficulties that a lot of people are in right now. And, and certainly that, that uh, uh, is, um, uh, it's on uh, the opportunities to save money, which are, of course, a, a huge driver for these marketplaces is what we found. We found that in our research that I think 17% uh, or so have used a, a rebate on their utilities um, um, website or on their on their marketplace. Their satisfaction is much much higher, and their satisfaction with the marketplace is higher, of course. And the interest in uh, in using rebates, uh, of course, is 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 uh, about 50 uh, between 50 and 60 percent. So you see a, a huge amount of interest on the part of uh, of customers to save money. And that's a, a big way for uh, utilities to draw in more uh, more interest in marketplaces in particular. And we see that yeah. with a, a lot of the uh, of the participants in this space. They'll they'll uh, you know emphasize the uh, the rebate, the discount. You know, draw a line through the old price and and make the uh, the, the, yeah. the new price more prominent, like Amazon does. Um, and if you make it clear, I'm saving you money. Uh, then that can be a really important way, especially in the in, in the area of marketplaces, to draw people in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Mark, yeah, I want to ask I, you a, a uh, question. We have this comes from a um, uh, from a, an audience member, a live audience member today, and uh, uh, the question is: uh, Do you think that, that there will increasingly be non-utility disintermediaries like uh, like Amazon and Apple that target beyond the meter revenue opportunities. Rob mentioned, you know, possibility for, uh, uh, you know, for, for four million dollars under cer certain circumstances. It's, uh, you know, it's a sizable revenue stream. What, uh, you know, what should we bear in mind as we as we think about uh, these non-utility players like Amazon and Apple potentially looking at uh, at, at some of these opportunities. Uh, yeah, it was a great question from Steve, and I and I hope he's still on. Um, the, I, we have an interesting perspective on this. So Ibex has been around for a long time. Um, we're we're in 26 countries. Um, I have I have 400 engineers uh, working across multiple industries, and we have some exposure to a variety of industries: telecom, for example, internet. 
um, TV and and voice services, wireless services, et cetera. Um, and and so my experience suggests that yes, there will be some of these companies. If you pay attention to Silicon Valley, the easiest way to get funding right now seems to be to say that you can disrupt a legacy industry. Um, but if we look really closely at the history of that kind of disruption, it's actually a pretty mixed bag. So. Um, for example, there there were some companies that wanted to get into fiber, and they found out how difficult it is to actually be an infrastructure company. Um, and so I, I do think that there's some research out there that from a consumer's perspective, they would, you know, if you ask a consumer, would you would you consider getting your power from another company? like an Amazon or something where, where the customer recognizes a very, very high level of, of customer satisfaction and brand affinity and, and, um, and support assumptions about that brand like an Amazon or an Apple, as you mentioned. Um, certainly, almost any consumer would say, say, sure, I'll take a look at that. But I think the appetite for, for experimenting and being an infrastructure company or having to compete with utilities in some of those spaces, um, I don't think there's going to be the same level of of long term um, affinity and long term stability for those for those firms. So yeah, I, you know, to get back to Stephen's question, I think I think there's going to be some companies that seek to disrupt and maybe disintermediate the relationship that utilities have with their consumers. Um, but actually, to be successful in that space is going to be hard. I mean, it, it it's tough, um, and utilities have some advantages that those those companies don't have. Um, so I, I would expect long term not to be the same level of disruption. We certainly haven't seen 99 companies able to offer Internet to every home in America. Um, so I'm not sure that that real disintermediation can take place in the infrastructure world without massive investments that that sometimes are a little bit hard to come by. Mm -hmm. um, I, w I wouldn't mind commenting on COVID, too, if, if we could return to that topic for just a minute. I think I think COVID has done three things for the utility industry. Um, and each of which is is opportunity um, mixed with the, the craziness. Um, COVID has given utilities an opportunity to engage very, very differently with their customers. Um, you know, the CARES Act and, and delinquent accounts and, and the financial pressures that a growing number or well, hopefully not growing much for much longer. Um, but, uh, you know, a massive number of people are, are struggling with has given the utility a new avenue for engaging with customers about saving money. It's mm -hmm. also shifted, as Rob mentioned, it's shifted a massive number of people, we think on a relatively permanent basis um, into work at home situations. Mm -hmm. um, I, know, I know plenty of Fortune 1000 companies that are rethinking their real estate strategy because they've discovered over the last nine months that they don't need everybody at headquarters or everybody in an office. Exactly. Um, and so more and more and more work from home gives the utility an opportunity to engage with customers about working from and living in the same location. Um, mm -hmm. And so utilities can actually engage on delivering different kinds of services, repair and protection plans, support plans, home connections like internet, TV, phone, um, you know, redundancy because Lord knows we've all experienced that. You know, we're, we're the the world is figuring out how to how to work on residential internet now, um, uh, in the vagaries of technology. So I think utilities, as a trusted brand, as as a trusted presence in every household's life, really has an opportunity to engage differently with their customers. Mm -hmm. um, a, a, another aspect is e-commerce is not going anywhere. It's mm -hmm. uh, it's it's now become a definitive and disruptive force in the way we we buy things and COVID's actually changed that again we think on a permanent basis um, the fact that my 77 year old father on a on a, um, a smartphone can now order from DoorDash and Uber Eats and get his groceries delivered to his home um, that tells me that that trend is not going backwards so mm -hmm. it's not a matter of waiting for Gen Z and Millennials to be the dominant force in the the install base it's now every consumer at a utility is now going to have higher expectations for digital engagement, for online commerce, for you know cleaner, faster, better websites, et cetera. And again, I think that e-commerce dimension gives an you know a, a real innovation lab to a utility to experiment with that that can you know impact other other digital opportunities within the customer base. Yep. Um, and then you know and finally, I think it's an opportunity going back to the first point. 
Mm -hmm. it's a it's a real opportunity for utilities to offer new products and services to their customers again um you know shift to work at home more people you know spending more time in their homes um even if we get back to a, a semblance of normal um that opportunity is still there for the utility to offer different kinds of plans and there's a limited window to establish themselves as the the right voice for the customer to listen to um, mm -hmm. and that's why i think a lot of these beyond the meter programs have a have perfect timing resulting from um, from COVID because the level of communication between utilities and their customers is not going to slow down over the next you know 12 to 18 months as we work through COVID and delinquent accounts and write-offs and, and all of all of those impacts so right. if, if utilities can really harness that I think it can be a force for positive change uh -huh. yep. yeah it makes sense good great hey Rob I wonder uh, uh, I'm mindful of the of the time and we're getting uh, near the end of our session today but I wonder if you could walk us through some of the key implementation considerations you talked a little bit about that earlier uh, the key implementation considerations and steps uh, that work well in building internal support and in, and in launching a beyond the meter program sure love to and I'll, I'll try to be very brief um, so it's it's a great question great conversation mark already alluded to kind of the build versus buy conundrum um, you know and in fact I talked to multiple utilities some of which are on this uh, uh, this power power session um, about now you know what's happened is that they've created some of these programs whether it's a physical search device or you know warranty programs or appliance repairs and and and, and unfortunately they've they've grown so significantly that now it's it's become a little more than they really care to manage they just didn't realize that they were going to be that successful um so you know that's one issue that you have to be careful of i you know i would obviously you know we're, we provide those services you can certainly look at the bill versus buy and you should look at the bill versus buy i love it was the the uh, previous uh, cto at uh, austin energy um in a conference one said if it takes you longer than a year to build it you need to you know you need to outsource it so that instead of spending three to five years trying to figure it all out just at least find a value you know a, a valuable viable partner start that way start externally you can always bring it internally uh that's easy to do you can start as a pilot if you outsource so that you have no you know no investments in time and resources etc i think it's again important to point out that you know our programs require not a single dollar of investment capital uh you know from our 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 utility partners um, so pilots I think make a lot of sense or a, a phased implementation crawl walk run as we call it start with one or two basic products you know gas line electric line before you get into some of the more you know advanced uh, uh, services or just some of our virtual programs um, like a virtual surge protection or a, a, virt, a consumer electronics program that would protect everything kind of in the house with a plug on it that's not an appliance. Um, so those are just some simple ideas. Now, as you get into like billing integration and call handling integration, you know, those are big things and um, they take time and effort and resources on both sides. We typically will always pay for those integrations uh, or reimburse the utility but um again those can be you know those are can be advanced we have some clients that will start that way right out of the you know right off the bat but the the, the beauty about all of these programs is that you can ease into them at your you know at, at your pace uh whether you want to jump in with both feet or if you just want to stick one toe in the water and try it for a couple of months or a couple of years that's okay we can we can devise and build custom programs around your specific needs in some instances we just build custom programs around the utility it's not really something we currently offer but something that they do so we'll actually buy that book of business or we'll help them manage that book of business you know where we're now taking that over on their behalf uh, or even some hybrids in between. But I think with just some open conversation, we can you really help walk you through how these implementation processes can be very, very painless, very simple, and, and have no cost associated whatsoever. Yeah. Okay. All right. Hey, and now we're in the in the lightning round here with questions. And let me <laughs> let me ask uh, Mark if you could start with this practical next steps uh, that you'd like to leave the audience with today. What uh, what are the practical things that they can do uh, 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 once they get off this uh, off this session today? That's a great question. I, I I we recommend to all of our partners that you know they do a little bit of an internal 
uh, discovery session. You know, talk talk about internally about what the goals and objectives would be. Is it, um, it, it you know, is it is it feasible to to engage with customers um, internally, or do you need a partner? Is it feasible to build uh, an e-commerce portal, or do you need a partner? What are the products and services that you want to offer? You, you know, uh, what's the kind of customer care engagement that um, we would you'd need in order to be successful? Um, and and just do a little bit of an internal discovery, um, and then you know it really is just a matter of of you know deciding on um, how, not if or when. Um, it's really a matter of deciding on how, because customer the, the research is overwhelming. Customers are ready for these things. They're asking for utilities to spend more time, uh, you know, engaging with customers and offering these products and services. The benefits to offering them are great. So it really just a matter of you know understanding what the goals would be, so that you can figure out how to to promote these types of programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Russ Henderson from Chartwell, what uh, what are practical next steps that you can offer? What I think Mark. Yeah, I think Mark covered it really, really well. Of course, you know, at, at the end uh, or at the at the beginning, it's important to, uh, of course, have begin with the end in mind. You want to uh, figure out what your strategic objectives are. Uh, I think with a lot of these marketplaces, the the objection, the objective in the in the beginning with some of the ones that were started a number of years ago, was to increase uh, uh, uptake of rebates. Right, that was pretty much it. You know, only seven percent or something of of, of uh, of the customers were using them, and then they kind of got a little bump in that, and then they were kind of satisfied. I think it's uh, it's more it's it's important to have a, a you know a full spectrum understanding of this thing and, and and spell out exactly what you're expecting from it, establish KPIs uh, for it, obviously, and and an ongoing develop an ongoing commitment is uh, as you know we've mentioned already in in this panel discussion. Having an ongoing commitment to uh, customer engagement, customer experience, and to marketing is uh, fundamental, I think, for these uh, products and services. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Rob Gilpin, you get the final word today. Practical next steps. Well, well, thank you, um, PJ. Could you um, pull up slide number eight for me, um, please, ma'am? So I think, you know, when you look at things like most people think of you know sort of the conventional marketplace as a place to sell smart thermostats and led light bulbs and, and obviously marketplaces have grown so much beyond that and you know mark's point about everything being mobile friendly if you can't you know if you can't create the the transaction from a mobile device you've, you've really missed the mark um you know we're now taking our conventional warranty programs that have historically been sold through direct you know direct mail direct marketing email marketing the 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 the, the move channel um and now moving those over into marketplace environments especially some of our more virtual products like the surge and consumer electronics as you see here you know a great place if you're not you know if you're not currently thinking about smart home or alarm uh services you really really need to be or how about offering you know sort of in-home technical support a geek squad sponsored by you know acme energy or a great place to position your mover services if you're currently using those types of programs or offering them or, or thinking about it or you know we we own a leasing company so being able to uh, provide generators um and and to do it affordably so that you know instead of having to fork out gosh you know six thousand dollars ten thousand dollars the ability to you know make it a 295 dollar you know monthly fee that appears on the utility bill as a convenience uh, or same with home you know home energy home battery storage and solar um and for us i think the next frontier you know in terms of our organization is predictive analytics yes we can you know we can react very well to fixing a broken hvac system but wouldn't it be really great if you know if you got a call from a partner of the utility that said you know david we're starting to see some you know strange alarms based on your hvac system your compressor is you know uh, 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 signaling in multiple times, much more than it should be. Um, so we think it's maybe just dirty filters, but would like to send somebody out to you know, to take a look. There's no cost, of course, because it's under your you know your protection plan. But it's one thing to fix something once it breaks, and we do that really well. But wouldn't it be great if we could prevent the failure to begin with? 
Um, so I think if you look at, you know, kind of the whole concept of a marketplace as really kind of a, a way of future proofing. And, you know, what we're talking about today will be different, obviously, than a year from today and, and two or five years from now. But to already have that foundation and that platform. So, you know, when we talk about a beyond the meter journey, I think, you know, what I'd love to do is to have some one on one conversations with, with all of you folks. And, and I know Mark would as well. And if you're not a member of Chartwell, you know, you really need to go visit their website and, and talk to them about you know the, the all of the data and the analytics that they provide to their members but let's have some one-on-one -on -one conversations and and really help you in your journey there's a lot of good analytics there are a lot of good customers that have already gone but you know uh, ahead of you with ibex and with american water um so you know we're not asking you to do something that you know is um bleeding edge by any means there's so many utilities that have done this ahead of you that are having great success and now they're able to grow and expand those programs so if you if you don't have a journey let's talk about getting one started in the next couple of years if you do have a journey already in place for beyond the meter let's talk about ways of expanding it you know if we can get 25 percent of your customer base involved in warranties that's great but not everybody's going to be interested in one particular product so again you know it's that's why ice cream stores sell lots of flavors, you know, different strokes for different folks, as they say. So I think this is a great place to start the discussion. And I'll, I'll guarantee you this, two years from now, the, the whole concept of beyond the meter will be a household term. It's still pretty new to utilities, but that's, that's changing. It's not just an evolution, it's now a revolution. So if you're not talking about it internally, you really need to start doing so. Great, thank you. Well, we'll hold you to that. We'll see you uh, the, the, at least uh, two years from now. I certainly hope much sooner than that. And and with that, I hate to bring this discussion to a close, but our time this time is up for this power session. We will review any unanswered questions from today's live event and can post answers under a special topic page within the next week or so. Energy Central also will be sending out a recording of the session along with a link to the follow-up Q&A within the next week. And please take a minute to complete our survey at the end of the session. Your feedback always is greatly appreciated and will be used for future sessions. I especially want to thank our sponsors today, American Water Homeowner Services and IBEX, and our three panel members for a terrific discussion, Rob Gilpin, Russ Henderson, and Mark Wilkinson. Uh, I'm your moderator, David Wagman, and for everyone at Energy Central, thank you for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you on an upcoming power session. PJ, back to you. Thank you, David. Thank you, speakers. Fantastic presentation. Thank you, audience, for attending. We hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. Please have a wonderful rest of your day, and this does conclude our conversation. Thanks.